Why don't you have a say in how our country's economy is doing? Richard Wolf lays it out. Check it out. Leave, the, leave your comments, ding the bell, share it with your friends, and subscribe to our channel. Welcome back to the second hour of our program. On the line with us is Professor Richard Wolf, the economist, co-founder of Democracy at Work, author of numerous books. His most recent, The Sickness is the System, When Capitalism Fails to Save Us from Pandemics or Itself, now also available as an e-book. Democracyatwork.info and rdwolf with two fs.com are his websites. You can tweet him at Prof Wolf, as in Professor Wolf, P-R-O-F-W-O-L-F-F. -F. And uh, Professor Wolf, welcome back. There's there's this uh, a fascinating piece on e Axios the other day, and I, I believe Sean shared it with you this morning, that uh, there, there's like these two competing uh, narratives about growth. One is that, you know, growth is a great thing because it, it increases prosperity and it increases the probability that you'll have new technologies that will be less carbon, res you know, uh, dependent and uh, over time growth will actually lead to a cleaner world. And then there's the other argument that, no, no, you've got to stop growth because growth is causing pollution and causing uh, so social problems and it's making us, you know, impinge on native areas that uh, are, you know, virgin forest and jungle and things which bring diseases into, into the uh, human society. And, 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 and there's other arguments, economic arguments as well. And I'm curious your thoughts on growth versus degrowth and these two, these two movements. Well, for me, the problem is putting this in that either or frame. It's really not, for me, a question of growth versus degrowth, but a question of what the objectives of an economic system are. Uh, that's the problem. We don't really have neither a public discussion about that nor any chance for a democratic decision by all the people, one person, one vote, as what we want our economy to do for us. But let me get to the core economics of it. The way the capitalist economic system that we have works is it has an ultimate goal. It's called profit. Profit is the bottom line. Profit is what a manager of a corporation is judged on. If the profit goes up, well, then you get rewarded. And if the profit goes down, you get punished. Ultimately, if profit goes down long enough, you go into bankruptcy and the entire enterprise ends. Once you have an economic system that works like that, it follows very strictly logically that you have to expand because your competitors are expanding, and if you don't do the same, they will have an advantage. Being bigger, their profit will be greater, they will be able to innovate with new machines. You, because your profit isn't so big, won't be able to do that, etc., etc. Every business school in this country teaches its students that when you go out there, sure, you can have social concerns and you can be a good churchgoer and all the rest, but profit is the name of the game and that's what you do. Once you have a system set up like that, growth is built in. Capitalism has been good at growing because it has to, because that's its organization. What we now have is a slowly developing recognition that that growth is good and necessary for capitalism, but not at all good and necessary for those of us who live in this system. And the clearest example is the climate issue, the ecological damage that this growth has done. But I would add other considerations. Having a fruitful job for everybody, that ought to be part of what an economy does. Having a decent income and not having extremes of wealth and inequality, that's also a better way to organize a society. And I could go on giving opportunity to people who have been denied it, making sure that education is a lifelong opportunity for people uh, as part of the job, that making sure child care is available so that people who have jobs do not have to worry that they're shortchanging their children. On and on and on. If we had a society that took these considerations into its consciousness and made their decisions that way, we wouldn't be having a conversation, either growth 
or no growth, we would have growth as one objective among many, but we would be making decisions about all of them. And in many cases, we would short, shorten the amount of growth in order to make more profit quality or the climate or all the other issues that a complex society cares about. It sounds like you're describing uh, the social democracies of Scandinavia and Northern Europe, uh, uh, you know, where capitalism is heavily regulated and right. and the society is, is the first priority as opposed to profit, uh, or at least a, a very high priority. Uh, do I have that right? Absolutely. They've taken steps in that direction. By the way, they still allow private capitalism. They still allow the profit motive to be the guiding bottom line driver of what happens. But you're right. They have developed the political organization and the consciousness to say that kind of system has to be hedged about with all kinds of limits, rules, regulations, uh, a big role for the government that is subject to democratic influences from the people, and so on. They have taken steps in that direction that the United States, the United Kingdom, and other countries have not yet figured out that they need to do as well. Yeah. So uh, I, I, in the previous hour, I had a debate with uh, uh, a libertarian economist um, and about corporate income taxes. Joe Biden is proposing to raise the corporate income tax from 21 percent to 28 percent. It was at 50 percent from the 1940s until the 1980s, the period of greatest wage growth in the history of the United States and the period of, of greatest business expansion in our country. I was making the argument that that corporate tax rate, in order to avoid paying income taxes on profits, corporate income taxes on profits, companies would depress their profits by investing in the company and paying their employees well. And, and, and he was making the argument that uh, that's not the case, I suppose. Um, I'm curious your thoughts on that. Well, I think the basic issue is you're quite right, Tom. Uh, there's no question that higher corporate taxes were associated in the post-World War II period with much faster rates of growth, that the corporate sector pushed heavily for taxes to be lowered in the name of job creation and economic growth, and the reality, the empirical reality is when they got their tax cuts, they did not invest them in economic growth. There were, of course, many reasons for them. They mostly invested them in raising uh, corporate pay packages and paying off their uh, stockholders with dividends and all the rest. But here's the bottom line. If you cut taxes on corporations, you're leaving them with the money to decide how to use it. Sometimes they will use it in the ways you hope. Other times they will use it in the ways you decry. The recent period they've used it in the way they want, which is to beef up their mergers, to beef up their dividends and all the rest. In a capitalist system, private enterprise has the final say. And all the government does with raising and lowering taxes is try to influence it without being able to make sure that what we want as a society is what these corporations do. And if I could say a word about uh, President Biden, he's proposing a 28 percent, as you rightly say. But the uh, agreement in Washington is quite clear that he won't get that. He'll get something less than that, depending on the usual Republican Democratic bargaining. So we will end up having come back less than halfway to the enormous tax cut given by Trump in December of 2017. And that tax cut, let's remember, an enormous gift to corporations and the rich came at the end of a 40-year period of redistributing wealth upwards. Uh, I'm disappointed, and I think it needs to be said.